And now here on this, the 55th weekly Friday show from Radio Free UK, we'd like to introduce you to a new source. This is from a blog talk radio station, One Dimitri Radio. It's run by Dimitri Vasilovos out of Pittsburgh, USA, which he set up with some kickstart funding. As well as putting out the weekly daily show on blog talk radio, he simulcasts on Facebook. Each show tends to be an opening monologue by Dimitri, and then an interview on a relevant subject. Dimitri presents as the lovable libertarian, and each week I hope to rebroadcast whichever of his daily shows is likely to be most relevant. Of course, if you like the content, you can click through and subscribe to him directly. With American presidential elections coming up, I think it's going to be very interesting to have an independent personal view on how things are panning out. In the show I've chosen this week, Dimitri opens by talking about Donald Trump and the trouble he got in for calling an American judge a Mexican. And that's followed by a very interesting interview with one Richard Potter about the plight of Pakistani Christian refugees, asking why so little is being done to help them. So welcome to the show, Dimitri. I look forward to working together. Progressive brings you Flowetry with Flow. Ring around the rosy, the rosy. In this case, being your car and home insurance bundled together to save you money. Oh, so cozy. Ashes, ashes. The mic falls down. Bundle home and auto and save with Progressive. Visit Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discounts not available in all states or situations. Blog Talk Radio. Okay, so um, great simulcast for you tonight. We're going to be talking about, well, me really just talking with you about the insanity that the media and the Republican Party is having over Donald Trump having this little kerfuffle thing with this judge who's an American But Donald Trump called him a Mexican. And now this thing has been going on for like four or five days, no end in sight. And I'm going, what is the big deal here? I don't get it. So we're going to be talking all about that. Also talking about the uh, Taco Bell dog and the Frito Bandito, Cinco de Mayo, and all sorts of stuff like that, because I'm nothing if not culturally sensitive. Also, great interview for you, Richard Potter. No, you've not heard of him, but you will someday, I think. He's a Pittsburgher. He's a social worker, but he's also a journalist. He goes halfway across the world to Thailand to write about Christian Pakistanis who are refugees and having an awful time. And the Christian community throughout the world doesn't seem to care a whole lot about Christian refugees, which to me is just amazing. It is just absolutely amazing. All right. Now, on Friday, oh, by the way. This is simulcast. Um, uh, the show is One Dimitri Radio. It's on blogtalkradio.com, and I simulcast it on Facebook Live five nights a week, 9 p.m. Eastern time, and um, that's uh, unless Facebook Live craps out, which usually it does, although the last two times it's been actually kind of sort of okay. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed, and hopefully it won't crap out on us again. Maybe they've fixed their problems. I don't know. Anyway, I'm at the intersection of freedom and fun, and in the studio here, the LifePedigree.com studio. More about that in just a bit. But uh, Donald Trump. Back on Friday, I started talking with you about this big deal in um, San Jose, California. Donald Trump supporters were uh, brutalized by uh, opponents, uh, by demonstrators, by rioters. They're just hateful, hateful people. San Jose police did uh, nothing. The San Jose mayor did nothing. It was was horrible stuff. Well, during that same period, Donald Trump had made a statement about a judge in a case, the Trump University case. And he didn't like the judge. He thought the judge was being unfair. And he said the judge should recuse himself or get off the case. I don't know what the legal terms are, but because he's Mexican. Well, turns out that he's an American of Mexican heritage. He was born in Indiana of Mexican parents. Well, you would have thought that Donald Trump called this guy the worst, most god-awful names in the history of god-awful names. Because since Friday, and I'm not making this up, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, today, and probably for the foreseeable future, all the media, is going on and on and on about, oh, how dare Donald Trump call this American of Mexican heritage 
a Mexican. Oh, because this is so terrible. This is racism. This is bigotry. And then to add insult to injury, you got the Republican Party establishment piling on. They're actually going on these uh, cable news channels going, oh, this is awful. This is terrible. This is Meanwhile, I'm scratching my head going, what's the big deal here? Okay, so he calls him a Mexican. The guy's an American of Mexican heritage. I mean, is that – okay, let me give an example. When people hear my name, they hear, you know, Dimitri Vassilaris, the lovable libertarian. And by the way, let me just – because I always get in trouble when I do this. I'm a libertarian. I'm a life member of the Libertarian Party. I vote only for libertarian candidates. I'm not going to vote for a Republican. I'm not going to vote for a Democrat. I vote only for libertarian. That said, there are two fascinating stories going on right now, one in the Republican Party and one in the Democratic Party. Tonight, we're talking about all the crazy stuff going on in the, in the Republican Party with Donald Trump. Um, doesn't mean that I'm defending him to vote for him or anything like that. I agree with some issues. I disagree with other issues. Same with everybody else. But this is just a fascinating story. And frankly, I think Donald Trump is getting a raw deal here. So let me explain. Let me explain. When people hear my name, Dimitri Vassilaris, and they don't know me. They don't know me as the lovable libertarian. They don't know me as uh, Anthony and Sophia's boy or anything like that. They have no concept of my history and talk radio across the country, Pittsburgh, whatever. Many times people will say, oh, you're Greek. Or they will say many times, actually even more times they say, oh, you're Russian. Because that whole Cyrillic alphabet thing, <clears throat> they're very strange letters. And I say to them, I, I'm not Greek. I'm not Russian. I'm an American of Greek ancestry. No big deal. No big deal at all. I don't consider being called Greek a put down. I don't consider being called a Russian a put down. I just tell people, no, I'm not a Greek. I'm an American of Greek heritage. You can trace our lineage all the way back to this little island called Ikaria. It's near uh, Asia Minor, Anatolia, what some people call Turkey. And that's where all my folks come from. It's not a put down if somebody says, I'm, I'm a Greek. I'm not. I was born in Pittsburgh, McGee Women's Hospital, and I'm an American of Greek ancestry. No big deal. So tell me why it's a big deal when Donald Trump says that this judge that he doesn't like, that there's some squabble regarding this case with Trump University, and who cares anyway. But what's the big deal if Donald Trump happened to have called him a Mexican? The judge is an American. He was born in Indiana of Mexican parents. So what? I'm an American of Greek parents. So what? Four or five days now, the media has been going on and on about this. And, oh, isn't this terrible? And, you know, Mexican voters, are, I mean, you know, Hispanic voters are going to be really upset. And this is racism, which, by the way, Mexico is not a race. And on and on. And for the life of me, I don't understand any of this. I don't understand what the big deal is with any of this. Well, actually, I sort of do. Let me explain this to you. By the way, if you'd like to call in and talk... Uh, studio line is 213-943-3733. That's 213-943-3733. Or if you're not listening as we're streaming this on blogtalkradio.com, it's one Dimitri Radio. If you're watching this, if you're experiencing this on Facebook Live, you can just write your comments and I'll try to read them. Uh, we've got uh, Dave and uh, Nicholas and Susan and John and uh, Larry, John, April, Robert, and uh, you know, thank you so much for joining us and all the others as, uh, as well. Robert's writing in. Trump said that his intention to build uh, the wall is having a direct effect on the pending case. OK, fine. Uh, John writes, George Stephanopoulos and James Carville did a job on Judge Starr to protect uh, the Clintons. Yeah, sure. And that's fine. I, you know, I have no problem with this. But the, the media, and that includes Fox News, includes all of them. That even includes Newt Gingrich, who until he opened his mouth, I think, on the Fox News, was in running to be Donald Trump's vice president, I think. Anyway, they're all losing their minds over this thing. They, I swear to God, they're going, this is awful. This is so terrible. Donald Trump called him a Mexican, but he's an American of Mexican of ancestry. And oh, my goodness gracious, what kind of message does this send about the Republican Party? And, oh, 
I'm dumbfounded. I'm watching TV. I'm watching all these cable news channels, and I am dumbfounded by this. It's like, so what? So what? He made a mistake. If, you know, it's, it, 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 he's an American of Mexican ancestry instead of a Mexican. It's like I correct people all the time. I'm not Greek. I'm American of Greek ancestry. It, I don't consider it a put down. So what's really going on here? Well, here's, here's what, uh, what I think in terms of the media. The political correctness of the folks in the media, and that in just all the media, including Fox News, is off the chart insane. They, have, they really have lost their minds. They have absolutely lost their minds. And they're going, tisk tisk, and this is horrible. This is terrible. I can't believe he said this. <clears throat> it's no big deal. It's not a put-down to say someone's a Mexican when he's an American of Mexican heritage. Just like it's not a put-down, and I wish I had a dollar for every time I had this, somebody calling me uh, Russian instead of American of Greek ancestry or you know, Greek, you know, American of Greek ancestry. It, 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 it's no big deal. I deal with this all the time. Believe me, it's no big deal. These aren't racist. They aren't bigots. They aren't evil. They're not nativists. They're not xenophobes. They're just people who say that I'm Greek when, in fact, I'm American of Greek ancestry. That's all this is. But the political correctness, off the chart, absolutely off the chart. And then these idiot Republicans, including Newt Gingrich, they're going out of their way to go on TV to say, <clears throat> oh, this is terrible. This is the, the worst thing in the world that you know, Donald Trump could have said. You know, We're trying to reach out to... Hispanics or Latinos, or I don't even know what the right term is. I mean, it's one or the other, I guess. And, you know, we're trying to get them. And what kind of message does this send? Well, the message that all of this sends is that you're idiots, that you're overreacting. I think you're pandering, quite frankly. It's like no big deal. When you get away from the beltway, when you get away from that media echo chamber that is somewhere between Washington, D.C. and New York, or maybe runs the whole, the whole way there, those of us here in flyover country, we don't care. We don't talk about it. We don't go, oh, did you hear Donald Trump, what he said? He said that the judge is, is Mexican when, in fact, he's American of, of Mexican ancestry. Oh, my God. Did you, I can't believe he did this. We don't talk like that. We didn't even mention it. It's no big deal. It just isn't. It's not like he called him the N-word or something like that, which would make no sense because he's a Mexican, American of uh, Mexican ancestry. But the point is, if they're acting as if this is a horrible put down, this is a you know, disgrace to Hispanics and all that, and, and it's not. We don't care. It wasn't a put down. It was a mistake. What's the, <clears throat> what's the big deal here? I mean, <sighs> you know, when you... Talk about uh, uh, Mexican imagery in American culture. You got your Cinco de Mayo. All right, fine. The Mexican uh, uh, army actually defeated the French in some battle that no one's ever heard of, but it was a great excuse to go from San Diego to Tijuana to get drunk if you were under 18. Cinco de Mayo. I think that's pretty much how it started. All right, fine. So you got your Cinco de Mayo. <clears throat> you got your Chihuahua. And not just any old Chihuahua. I'm talking about the Taco Bell Chihuahua. That uh, he and actually he speaks Mexican, or at least he did until he died. Um, so you got your, your your Taco Bell Chihuahua. You know, no one is saying the Taco Bell is racist or or bigoted because again, Mexican is not a race. You're bigoted because you know they were uh, playing off you know Mexican heritage. It's a friggin' Chihuahua for God's sake. There's that. You got your Frito Bandito. You know, are people saying that, I don't even know, Frito-Lay, I'm guessing, you know, was, was you know, putting down Mexican heritage with the Frito Bandito? I love the Frito Bandito. I mean, what, what's not to love about the Frito Bandito? And there are a million and one other examples of Mexican references in American culture, and it's no big deal. Why, heck, even on Cinco de Mayo, Donald Trump was eating out of a, out of a taco bowl, and he seemed to enjoy it. <laughs> it's like. It's, it's just no big deal. I can't take this seriously. But the wall-to-wall -wall coverage of this thing on the news, including this evening, before I came on uh, into the studio here, the LifePedigree.com studio, is, is mind-boggling to me. 
It's absolutely mind-boggling. And now Donald Trump is going to be doubling down because he was on a conference call with his supporters going, the judge is unfair, and you know we need to fight back, and this kind of a thing. And I'm going to explain about something about Donald Trump here that the media absolutely does not get. It just absolutely does not get it. I get it because I understand how this guy thinks and operates. I really do. It's just To me, it's as, as, as plain as can be. Uh, a lot of folks, again, are writing in uh, with the um, – uh, let's see here. Uh, Angie, ha ha ha, love the music in relation to the story about Trump, uh, Los Lobos. And the judge who was born in Indiana, as the song says, uh, the Greeks don't want no freaks. La Raza is horrible. The judge is part of that group. You know, they burn American flags and wave Mexican flags. Trump has said a lot worse. So what is correct? Too much PC, too much. I've given uh, special attention to people of my ancestors' uh, race. When I think Mexican, I think pretty ladies. Well, sometimes um, <clears throat> some Mexican ladies are pretty, some are not. Some Mexican men are handsome, some are not. Some American women are pretty, some are not. Some are not. Some American men are handsome, and some of us are not at all. Oh well. So, all right. So you've got all of that. So no big deal. But the media is going on and on about this, continues to go on and on about this, and honestly. I, I tell you this, I can't wrap my mind around this. Day after day, this one stupid story, the guy made a mistake. It should have been, he's not a Mexican, he's an American and Mexican heritage, and that's why he doesn't like me, and you know, the wall and all that. Okay, fine. God almighty, people, give it a rest. Jesus, I mean, God, oh. So, okay, so there's there's all of that. And by the way, there's going to be more of this stuff. And it was a great excuse for the media to not mention the two big stories over the past few days. One, of course, the San Jose um, um, riots against the Trump supporters where the police just stood back for an hour and a half letting the, the, the rioters beat up on the, pro- on the uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, supporters. It was horrendous. The other big, which I talked at length about, and the other story, which is getting almost no airplay right now in the media, is the jobs report. There were only like 38,000 or so jobs that were um, created in this uh, last uh, reporting period, and there were supposed to be like, I don't know, like 200,000. I mean, the economy is tanking, and no one's talking about this in the media because they're going on and on day after day after day. Day after day, <gasps> Donald Trump said Mexican when he should have said American and Mexican ancestry. That's it. That's, that's the whole news cycle for the past umpteen days. I, I, I... Honestly, there are times, and I, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say this, as I'm talking to my listeners on blogtalkradio.com, One Dimitri Radio, that's the name of our show, and talking to my Facebook friends, there are days, there are times, like right now with this episode, where I think I'm living in a parallel universe. And I cannot for the life of me fathom why everyone else in the media is focused on this thing and making it like it's a big effing deal, that it's some kind of a curse thing, a curse word or a put down or anything like that. When it's just Donald Trump being Donald Trump, not cursing the guy, he made a mistake. He should have said Mexican-American or uh, American and Mexican heritage, but he called him Mexican. Big effing deal. Sorry. And again, I'm exhibit A. Oh, you're Greek. No, no, I'm I'm an American of Greek ancestry. Hi, nice to see you. That kind of a, that's, 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 that's all it is. It's like there's another world out there that is just deranged, another universe. And then there's us, where we're like normal people with orange, yellowish hands, normal people, and that we can't understand what they're doing. I think there are more of us than there are of them. I really do. I think there's so many more of us. The vast majority of people in flyover country, that's the whole area between Washington, New York and Washington, D.C., if you could like draw a sort of a line and go all the way to the West Coast where they, you know, they fly like from New York or Washington to Los Angeles. 
All of that's flyover country. That's us. We don't care. I've not met one person. I've not spoken to one person who's even brought this thing up saying, oh, Donald Trump, he cursed. He, he, he put the man down. He called him a Mexican. I haven't met one person. We just we, we, we don't care. We absolutely do not care. So I felt that had to be said. <clears throat> so one of the things that I try to do with One Dimitri Radio is I try to give you, my listeners, my friends, something that they cannot get anywhere else. In this case, logic, sanity, reason, level-headedness. How ironic is that, me being level-headed? But when you take a look at how everyone else in the media is reacting, and I mean through this evening, this is Monday night, and right before I came into the LifePedigree.com studio here, they were still talking about this and how awful this is and how terrible this is and what kind of message this is sending. And I was going, I can't wait to get on the air here to talk with my listeners, with my friends, because I, honest to God, believe there are more of us than there are of them. I really do. It just. <laughs> All right. So what else is uh, going on here? A lot of other folks are joining us, and I really appreciate that. Steve and Andrea. Oh, uh, Andrea. Uh, Bob, uh, Steve. OK, Sarah. OK, great. <clears throat> Donald Trump is fascinating to me. As soon as he got involved, I didn't really pay much of attention to Donald Trump before he got involved in politics because I just wasn't all that interested. He's a you know celebrity in New York. He's a big deal developer. Okay, fine. Then he has this show, The Apprentice, and I don't well, I don't think I ever watched it. Maybe like the one part of like the last episode of the first season or something like that. I'm not into reality shows. I'm just I just don't care. Just absolutely don't care. But as soon as he got involved in politics, as soon as he decided to run for president, I started watching him and I understood him. I got him like that. It's like I know exactly what this guy is doing. He's the equivalent of Howard Stern in politics. And I know how Howard Stern operates. I know how people react to him. Donald Trump is doing the same thing. He's doing Howard Stern's thing in politics. And it's working, and I absolutely get all of it. The people in the <clears throat> me, <clears throat> the people in the media who are who have been losing their minds over this this racial slur, this bigoted remark that oh he's Mexican, he's not Mexican, he's oh how dare he call him a Mexican? They're all saying, well, he should have really apologized, and he's got to back off on this thing, and oh my goodness, this what kind of message is this sending, and they're giving him all sorts of advice and all that kind of stuff. And uh, today, Monday, I'm watching, uh, with all due respect, on Bloomberg, and you've got your Mark Halperin, and you've got your John Heil- Heilman, Heil- I keep forgetting his last name. Anyway, um, and they were interviewing somebody from Bloomberg who got a scoop who got this exclusive. The reporter knows someone who was on a conference call with the Donald today. And Donald Trump was talking in this conference call about how his people, his supporters should be handling this Mexican judge thing. And Donald Trump was saying, We've got to double down. I'm paraphrasing here. We've got to double down here. You've got to go after the judge. You don't back off. You make your case, that kind of a thing. And the uh, co-hosts on Bloomberg were going insane. They're going, my God, Donald Trump is, is pouring gasoline onto this fire. He's, what's he doing? This is crazy. This isn't the primary. This is the general election. He, he should be backing off. He should be apologizing. He should be doing this, that, and the other. Pretty much the attitude by everyone in the media. And including all the Republicans, a lot of them are rhinos who are who were who are ready to just write off Donald Trump and say, oh no, this is terrible. He never should have done this and all that. Meanwhile, again, remember, this is a parallel universe. There's all of them and then there's us. I understand what Donald Trump is doing with this thing. Again, if you really want to understand Donald Trump, the, the politician, just look at Howard Stern. That's the secret. He does, he operates the same way that Howard Stern does. Howard Stern doesn't back down. He doesn't back off when he makes some comment or whatever. It's not mean. It's not vicious. It's politically incorrect sometimes. It's funny. Sometimes it'll make you wince or whatever. But it's not, he's not doing it to to hurt people. 
And a lot of the people respond to that. They're like, my God, this guy is real. Howard Stern is real. Donald Trump is real. And yes, warts and all, but you know, I get it. And I'll give him a pass because he's real. If you want to understand Donald Trump, the political Donald Trump, understand Howard Stern. That's all this is. That's all this is in terms of the chemistry and the way he's thinking and the way he operates. So all these guys, especially the two on um, Bloomberg, could not understand why Donald Trump is telling all his people, got to double down, got to fight even harder regarding this judge thing. Immediately. I got it immediately. And it made perfect sense for who Donald Trump is and how Donald Trump operates. Donald Trump is a human, as I am, although he's richer. We all make mistakes. We're humans. We make mistakes. How we handle those mistakes varies depending on the person. Donald Trump is like one of those generals. Did you see the, this incredible, in fact, the greatest thing that there's ever been on television Ken Burns, the Civil War. I guess it's about 20 some odd years old now. I don't know. But it's still, anytime I see it during like Pledge Week or something like that, I'm still in awe of this production. I mean, just in awe of this thing. I forget which general. I think it was U.S. Grant. I think. But there's this one general, and there may be others. In fact, I'm sure there are others, who his greatest strength was that he would never give up. Even when he lost a battle, he would just come right back the next day, and he was relentless, just utterly relentless. Win, lose, draw, it didn't matter. He kept coming after you and coming after you and coming after you, never backed down. I believe it was Grant. If you could help me out with this, that would be great. Well, that's Donald Trump. Donald Trump never retreats. Donald Trump never says he made a mistake. What Donald Trump does when things don't go his way, whether he made a mistake or it was just something else, he typically just doubles down and is just that much more relentless coming after you and coming after you and coming after you. And that's what he does. And frankly, a lot of people respect that. Heck, I respect that. I respect that a lot. He's not backing down regarding this thing. He is not going to let the politically correct media, including the politically correct wusses in the Republican Party, get him to back down on this thing. The media has made a mountain out of a molehill. Oh, he's Mexican. No, he's American of Mexican heritage. Okay, fine. So what? But Trump's not backing down. And I admire that trait. Now, again, I'm not going to vote for him. I'm a libertarian. I'm going to vote for Gary Johnson and uh, Bill Weld. Libertarian Party, no question about it. But I admire that trait in Donald Trump, and I understand that trait in Donald Trump. And that trait, in spite of what you're seeing in the media right now and all the cable news channels and the Democrats, you know, political consultants are saying, oh, this is, oh, this is terrible, tisk tisk, and, you know, let me clutch my pearls and this, that, and the other. When the camera's not on them, the savvy Democratic Party politicians, the ones who understand how campaigns work, the consultants, I've got to believe that they are crapping their pants right now because of what Donald Trump is doing, the way he is doing this. They understand that they are in for the fight of their lives with this guy because Donald Trump does not back down He doubles down, and that is what he's doing with this whole Mexican judge thing. And in politics, when you've got a candidate like that who simply will not be browbeaten, who will not back down, who will not be intimidated, even when he screwed up, especially when he screwed up, those Democratic Party consultants have got to be terrified. They have got to be terrified because they – understand the mentality here they understand who this guy really is i get who this guy is if there was a war i'd want donald trump as my general he's like a modern day Patton. guy knows one gear forward that's it that's what he does verbally and you know just the way he operates that's what this guy does forward 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 relentless something else that's really interesting here that no one's bringing up other than me is Foreign leaders, whether it's Putin or the latest dictator in China or 
um, really, or anyone, really, any, any foreign leader, any foreign leader, any foreign leader right now is looking at Donald Trump going, well, if this guy becomes president of the United States, we've got a problem here because this guy is unlike all the others. This guy takes no prisoners. This guy is relentless. This guy does not back down. This guy scares the crap out of us. And I think they will, in fact, I'm sure they will respect him because they're going to respect him because they're going to fear him. When it comes to international politics, making nice and, you know, kumbaya and all that, that doesn't cut it. They have to fear you in order to respect you. And what Donald Trump is doing right now with this, this, this nothing burger of a story about this Mexican judge, the way that he's handling it is sending messages all across the world, especially to Putin and, again, the latest dictator of the, you know, in, in China, that, hey, we've got someone here that we're not going to be able to intimidate, we're not going to be able to push around, and who could make our lives a living hell. I'm telling you, I believe, I absolutely believe that world leaders right now, just like Democratic Party consultants, they understand what's really happening. Like I understand and like I'm sharing this with you. They're terrified because they know what kind of force this guy is. This guy is not backing down. He is showing strength to the nth degree, even when he's wrong, even when he's screwed up. Doesn't matter. I'm going forward. I'm going to win this thing. I'm not going to be intimidated by these people. That was the message today in this conference call. That was the message. If you're looking for a strong leader, and that's your only criterion, which I hope it isn't, by the way, but if you're looking for a strong leader, what Donald Trump is doing right now with this, this, this nothing story, I think is an indicator that... Well, you got yourself your strong leader, if that's what you want. This guy's not backing down. He is relentless. God, he's relentless. Um, a lot of people like that. I think it's going to play very well in flyover country. Play very, very well. Very well. And again, those of us out here, we're not talking about it. We don't care. We know it wasn't a, you know, a, a, a curse or a um, name-calling thing. You know, it wasn't like he was, you know, calling him some horrible name or anything like that. He called him a Mexican. Okay, it's an American and Mexican heritage. Jesus, come on. We get it. Donald Trump is amazing. He is just amazing. I mean, his personality, his, the way he thinks and the way he operates. This is pure Donald Trump. Now, and This is almost a replay with the media of what happened months ago. Do you remember the first major screw up that Donald Trump did? Major screw up. I don't know if it was the first, but it was, it was viewed as a major screw up. Months and months and months ago, Donald Trump made a comment about Senator John McCain. John McCain was a prisoner of war during the Vietnam War. His plane was shot down. He was in the Hanoi Hilton for a number of years. And Donald Trump said, in essence, that he didn't consider him a hero because uh, he prefers heroes who don't get captured, something to that effect. And the world was appalled by this. Meanwhile, those of us in flyover country are going, well, yeah, McCain certainly you know, served his country, and it's terrible that he was at the you know, Hanoi Hilton and all that, but you know, that kind of makes sense. You know, The heroes are the ones that don't get, you know, that kind of a thing. Everyone else in the media thought that this was a terrible thing. Donald Trump had really just ended his campaign. Not me. Not me, because I know there are a lot of people uh, who don't like John McCain, who, yes, appreciate his service, no question, and cannot begin to fathom what this poor man and many others suffered as prisoners of war. We absolutely get that. But Donald Trump was saying, hey, I don't consider him a hero. And then Donald Trump said, oh, well, she got schlonged in talking about uh, Hillary Clinton getting beat or something. Schlonged. And, of course, that was some sort of reference to male genitalia. And, oh, this is terrible. Donald Trump is going to lose the election now because he said schlonged and used a graphic term like this. And then there was, it was, again, no big deal. No big deal. And really, the, 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 maybe the biggest thing with Trump 
which I thought, again, it fits perfectly with what you're seeing right now. And that is Donald Trump in the South Carolina Republican primary debate. Do you remember that thing? That was unbelievable. Here you had Donald Trump in the heart of this uh, military-friendly area, an area that still loved the Bushes, including George W. Bush. They still loved this guy down there. And here's Donald Trump in the middle of this Republican Party debate trashing George W. Bush and then doubling down saying that this invasion of Iraq was based on a lie. This was at the Republican primary debate in South Carolina. All the pundits, all the political pundits were going, oh, well, this is the end of his campaign. He's going to lose South Carolina. This is the, you know, Bushes are beloved and, you know, the war in Iraq. Donald Trump killed it. In the primary election, he killed it. In fact, it was so bad for Jeb, that's J-E-B exclamation point, that Jeb ended his campaign. And there have been many other examples of this where Donald Trump says or does something. The media is going, oh, oh my God, this is terrible. This is the end of it. He doesn't back down. He doesn't apologize. He doubles down. And he does even better. And the media just never learns, including a lot of the Republican establishment. They simply never learn. And as Exhibit A is what's happening right now, tonight. And for the past four days, they're going on and on about, oh, how terrible this is. He actually called them the M word, you know, Mexican, instead of American of, of Mexican heritage. Oh, this is the end of his campaign, and no, no, no Hispanic is going to vote for the Republicans. And, oh, they've, we've lost the election. And, oh, he's got to back down. He's got to apologize. <laughs> the same thing all over again. And Donald Trump is going, screw it. I'm not apologizing. I'm doubling down. I'm going to make my case. This judge is cheating. This is unfair. This is, you know, whatever it happens to be. Makes perfect sense to me. I get all of it. And I think he's going to win. And by winning, I mean he's not going to really suffer from this at all. Because the average voter doesn't give a damn. And the ones who are paying attention to this are going, all right, he called them Mexican. It should have been American and Mexican ancestry. It's like, Okay, fine, whatever, who cares? I'm more concerned about getting a job, you know, that kind of a thing. In fact, I'll do you one better. I would not be surprised when polling happens over the next few days regarding this thing. I would not be surprised if Donald Trump's popularity increases. I'm not saying that it will. I I don't know that. But I would not be surprised if it increased. Because he's showing one thing that American voters, after eight years of dithering from behind, the one thing that a lot of American voters say they want, and that is a strong leader. This is showing strength. He's not backing down. He's not apologizing. He's doubling down, and you're all going to know it. That's Donald Trump. Um, (laughs) I get what this guy's doing. I absolutely get it. And you you watch the cable news channels and not one of these people has a clue. They just they don't have they just don't have a clue about this. Meanwhile, those of us in flyover country get it. It's like, you know, yeah, of course that's what's happening here. It's amazing. A lot of folks are writing in, <clears throat> a lot of Facebook friends. Uh, let me see. That was so sweet. Uh, he did that. He exposed the BS. We need that in our nation. That's Steve and let's see, Bob Gazzardi, the scoop of those uh, suffering from battered conservative syndrome no longer surprises those uh, who have followed the past 15 years. GOP political stooped and cultural Marx, steep Marxism. OK, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it goes on and um, and on. So a lot of people agree with me. Um, as I suspected they would, I, if you just watch the media, which I do a lot, the media fascinates me. I'll watch every media show I can. I, uh, I'm always watching you know, TV and you know, news cable channels, the news channels. Oh, my God, I can't get enough news. It, honest to God, astonishes me how clueless they are and how clueless they've been regarding Donald Trump. And even before that, the Tea Party, they are so utterly clueless. They just don't understand how we function. 
And they're going on and on like this is a big deal because he said the M word. <laughs> what? Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> Let me tell you about uh, LifePedigree.com. We're in the uh, LifePedigree.com studio. LifePedigree.com was a big backer of our show when we started our Kickstarter campaign. And they uh, were in a bidding contest to uh, have the naming rights. They won. And I was you know, really thrilled about that because this is a great company. LifePedigree.com, what, uh, what it does is um, you send your resume to LifePedigree.com. LifePedigree.com reviews your resume, makes all the phone calls to make sure that everything that you're saying on your resume is true. And if everything checks out, it puts its seal of approval on your resume in the form of that gray squiggly thing that you need your phone to scan and all that. But then when you send your resume, the people who are getting it are going to see that it was already checked out by LifePedigree.com. They don't have to do any work. They know you're telling the truth. So I think your resume is going to go to the top of the resume pile increasing your chances of getting a gig. So lifepedigree.com. These are good people. This is a great idea. If you're an honest person, send your resume there. I think it's going to help you get a gig. Money well spent. Lifepedigree.com. All right. Now, <clears throat> we've got a lot of other folks who are uh, sending us notes. Uh, Trump was never supposed to make it uh, this far. That's true. Rob Milford, uh, our man in Florida probably feels the same about Greek judges. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <clears throat> it's just, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no question. All right. Well, we've got all of that uh, going on. And by the way, the um, cable news uh, people still have not made any reference, as far as I can tell, to uh, Donald Trump being in California all this time with all these rallies. Because I told you back on Friday, it's not about the primary. This is about the general election in November. Trump is already planting seeds. He's going to make California a, a state that the, the Democrats are going to have to really fight for, spend a lot of time and energy just to hold on to it, depleting their valuable resources. And I'm telling you, Trump is brilliant. And for anyone who thinks that Donald Trump is not going to have that wall built if, if he becomes president, if you believe nothing, I know this guy. I just know how this guy thinks and operates. If he does nothing else in four years, if, it, if there is, in fact, President Donald Trump, which I think there's a pretty good chance there will be, but you never know. But if there is a President Donald Trump, you could bet your last dollar that if he does nothing else, he will do one, at least this one thing. And that is he's going to build the wall. There is no question in my mind about this, because the one thing about Trump, in fact, I had a conversation with Pat Manley about this, this great architect who's a big, big friend of the show. I said, the one thing about Trump is that whatever knock you have against him, whatever the complaints have been about Trump over the years, over the decades, the one thing that you never hear is that Donald Trump has a history of unfinished projects. You never hear that. You hear people say, well, some of his projects went under Chapter 11, bankruptcy, this, that, and the other, or, you know, he was deep in debt, or 101 other things, which may or may not be true, but okay, fine. But even his harshest critics never say that Donald Trump, you know, when he starts something, he does not finish it. And Donald Trump has started something with this wall. If he becomes president, bet your last dollar. He will have that wall built. There's no question in my mind about that because that's what he does. He is relentless. He, it, he just, he's like Patton in a way. He's actually like Patton. Just keep going, keep going. One forward gear. Keep going, keep going. That's what he does. Now, you, you might find that admirable. You might find that disgusting. I don't know, but that is who he is. And this, this, this nothing burger of a story with this Mexican judge is as good an example as, as any that you're going to find. The easy thing for Trump would have been to just back down and say, oh, I'm well, sorry, I made a mistake. We should really focus on something else and, oh, um, you know, and then do some sort of penance or something like that. That's what most would do. Certainly Mitt Romney would have done that. Oh, my God, Mitt Romney would have been mortified. Uh, McCain would have done that. Not Donald Trump. No, sir. Not Donald Trump. I get how this guy thinks. I get how he operates. And this is classic Donald Trump. 
one forward gear. And no one is going to make him apologize about anything. Just ain't going to happen. That just ain't going to happen. And that type of attitude has served him well, has served him very well. He does break all the rules. He doesn't pay attention to the media saying, well, you need to apologize. And the Republican establishment, well, you need to apologize. This is terrible. Apologize for what? You called a man a Mexican when he's an American of Mexican heritage. When, since when is Mexican a curse word? When is it a curse word? So he mistook his, his uh, citizenship for ethnicity. And so it should have been American of Mexican heritage or Mexican-American. That's it. That's all it was. That's it. <sighs> anyway, so, all right, I've been talking too long here. Um, I have a great interview for you tonight. Now, you've not heard of this guy, but I think you will over time. He's a writer. He's a reporter. He's from Pittsburgh. In fact, we did the interview. <laughs> I almost forgot about this. <clears throat> I did the interview with this guy um, on Sunday, yesterday. He's in Sewickley. He went over to Thailand to cover this really interesting story. If you're a Christian or if you know somebody who's Christian, you're really going to want to listen to this interview. There are Christians throughout the world who are tiny minorities of their respective nations. Pakistan, one of our allies, has a tiny Christian minority. And these Christians are having just a horrible time in Pakistan, just horrible. And again, Pakistan, an ally. And so some of these poor Christian um, Pakistanis are trying to become certified United Nations refugees. Because if you get the official UN certification somehow, then you can go into another country uh, legally, whether it's the United States or Canada or Australia or whatever. And so you've got a lot of these Christians now who are leaving Pakistan and other countries, but this guy focused on Pakistani Christians, and going to Thailand because that's where the whole UN process thing is or something to that effect. The way those poor people are being treated is unbelievable. And one of the things that I discovered in my interview, which you're going to hear on blogtalkradio.com, this guy Richard Potter, is that Major Christian organizations and and major Christian leaders, whether it's the Pope or the Patriarch or the head of the Anglican Church or high-profile Protestant leaders in this country and others like them and big-deal Christian organizations, pretty much ignored the problem of Christian refugees. They're being treated horribly throughout the world. And this guy, Richard Potter, interviewed several of them, and the stories that these poor people had, they're just, they're heartbreaking. Again, if you're a Christian, or if you know somebody who's a Christian, make sure you have them listen to this interview. Because toward the end of the interview, I was talking with Richard Potter about, well, where are all the Christian organizations? I mean, you know, there are many nations that are, you know, predominantly Christian. They're typically Western nations. They're affluent. They're powerful, and whether it's the United States or any of these others, why aren't they doing anything? His answer, I thought, was fascinating. So please listen for that. Anyway, this guy, oh, that's where I was going with this. I did the interview. The guy was in Swickley when I'm doing this interview. Toward the end of the interview, first time this ever happened, toward the end of the interview, it's a, it's a phoner. He's on his phone. I'm here in the studio recording it. Toward the end of the interview, I hear this horrendous noise. I said, what the heck was that? He said it was a foghorn that apparently in Sewickley or near Sewickley or some crazy ass thing, I don't even know what, there's this huge foghorn that they blow, somebody blows, and you can hear it throughout Sewickley. Now, if you don't know what Sewickley is like, Sewickley is like really nice old money, lots and lots of money. They got sidewalks, they've got beautiful homes, and then you go to Swickley Hill, then Swickley Heights. I mean, we're talking money, money, money. And yet in this interview, toward the end of the interview, you hear this incredible fog. <laughs> and he said, everybody in Swickley can hear this thing. I, I was stunned. I had no idea. So anyway, it's a, it's a great interview. You learn a lot. And I even asked Richard uh, Potter, why is it that the media is not covering this thing? This is an amazing story. 
heartache and you know, the human uh, suffering and you know, Christian refugees. Whoever talks about Christian refugees, you hear about Muslim refugees, understandably so. You hear about Kurds, understandably, and the Yazidis or whatever they're called. You know, okay, fine, got it. But you don't hear about Christian refugees and how the horrible the, the experiences they have. Why not? I don't know. He said the only other medium that covered this, this story, was the BBC. So I said to Richard, so you're telling me <clears throat> that the only media that has covered this story is the BBC and now One Dimitri Radio. Is that what you're saying? He said, yes. So <clears throat> I thought to myself, well, that's kind of cool. Because <laughs> now I'm right up there with the BBC. That's great. And uh, for those of you who are a little confused by that, if you're on Craigslist a, a little too often, BBC is actually um, uh, media in uh, England, British Broadcasting Company. That's what we're talking about, BBC, not the stuff you see on Craigslist. No. All right, fine. So there's that. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Larry saying Trump was never supposed to make it this far. Right. Uh, Steve is writing. Uh, that's funny you said that about the UN being it's uh, D-Day whom U.S. troops fought and died in Normandy to have useless uh, GRP of UN deny these Christians freedom. Oh, yeah, it's an amazing story. Media in this country won't cover it. But this guy from Pittsburgh, my fellow Pittsburgher, Richard Potter, went to Thailand and talking about the prisons that they have there for the refugees. Oh, it's horrible stuff. And the Christian organizations uh, aren't doing much of anything about it. I mean, it's, it's, I can't. It's again, it's like we're living in a parallel universe where there's us and then there's like all of them. And if I didn't know any better, uh, I'd say we're the crazy ones, but we're not. They are. So I've got this uh, for you. Uh, Keith is joining us from uh, Phoenix, where it's 199 degrees, but it's a dry heat. Okay, that's great. All right, so that's just about it for the simulcast of One Dimitri Radio tonight. Again, uh, what? by the way, Facebook Live did not crap out again. This is like three or four nights in a row. My God, this is working out. This might, they may actually have fixed their problem. I certainly hope so anyway. We simulcast every weeknight, 9 p.m. Eastern time, Pittsburgh time. We uh, do the show, One Dimitri Radio, on blogtalkradio.com. That's when we stream, and then also Facebook Live. So you can see the show. You can see the lifepedigree.com studio. You can see me, which is, I know, kind of a drawback, but what are you going to do? It's the magic of uh, video. And... Um, if you don't want to catch when we're streaming on Blog Talk Radio, you can always download an episode, any episode you want, right from the first one here at One Dimitri Radio. Just go to blogtalkradio.com, download the episodes. There you are. So if you want to hear this show or you want to hear Richard Potter's interview and you can't do it now, well, just remember that you know, we aired it on Monday, um, D-Day, June 6, 2016. And um, listen to it you know, whenever you want, because it's something that you're not going to get anywhere else unless it's the BBC. <laughs> so a pretty good company here. I kind of liked that when he said that. Well, there's the BBC, Dimitri, and there's you. That's it. No one else is talking about this. And I'm going, my God, with all the Christian, frankly, listeners and friends that I have. I mean, I have many who are you know, atheists and agnostic and you know, Jewish and you know, some Muslim and Hindu and you know, all which is fine, you know, probably even have a druid or a born-again druid here among us. Who knows? Um, but I just found it amazing that others are not covering this heartbreaking story. Christian refugees trying to get a break from the UN, ending up in prisons, just trying to escape with their lives from countries that are our allies. Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and on and on, and what these countries do to these, these poor Christians, they're, they're minorities. And our government kind of looks the other way because these are our allies. It's, it's an amazing, an amazing story. So that is uh, Richard uh, Potter. So thank you very much for um, joining us with a simulcast part. We're going to end the uh, Facebook Live part. But don't forget to please follow me on Facebook Live. Yes, you can follow me. You can also friend me, although we're just about maxed out with uh, friends, but you can certainly follow me on Facebook. 
And also you can follow me on Twitter. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, maybe you have an idea for a show. Ooh, in fact, we've got to call this one lady back, a libertarian. I was going to call her today and I, ah, you idiot, I forgot. Sounds like she's got a very compelling story. So I've got to give her a call back and see if we can get her um, get her recorded and go from there. Anyway, so if you have an interesting story, something that you think my listeners would find interesting, then by all means, um, get in touch with me. Message me, Facebook, DM me, Twitter, email me, one Dimitri Radio, one Dimitri Radio.com. Give me your pitch. Tell me what you'd like to talk about. You think our listeners would be interested in this? Yeah, we'll give it a try. What the heck? Why not? Thank you again for joining us on the Facebook Live part of our simulcast. We will continue with our streaming of One Dimitri Radio on blogtalkradio.com. And again, please consider following me and friending me and pitch me ideas. We've got this incredible thing here. You know it's not like any kind of media that you're used to, the conventional media that you see everywhere else. You know how I think. I think like, I think how you think. And we realize that those other people, they're the crazy ones. It's not us. They're the crazy ones. So we're on the same wavelength here. And I think that's a good thing. Either that or it's a really frightening thing. I'm not quite sure come to think of it now. Anyway, let me start this uh, interview here with uh, Richard uh, Potter. And um, I think you'll find it uh, really, really interesting. And again, certainly no one in America is covering this. Um, these poor Christian refugees, what they're going through. And no one, uh, no one seems to care. It's the damnedest thing. It's just the damnedest thing. So I'm on Facebook a lot and on Twitter when I'm not doing my simulcast on Facebook Live and uh, blogtalkradio.com. And one of the things that I say when I'm interacting with everyone is that, hey, you know, if you have an interesting story, if you have something that you think my listeners might find interesting, get in touch with me. Uh, DM me on Twitter, message me on Facebook, send me an email, whatever. Give me your pitch. Let me know what you're thinking about. And let me think to see if maybe my listeners could fi would find that interesting. And then if I think they would, then maybe we can get you on the air. Now, let me be brutally honest with you. The vast majority of people don't do anything. They just don't, which frankly amazed me. I thought I'd be inundated with requests from people going, hey, yeah, I want a story. I want to talk about this. Actually, there are very few. Again, I'm amazed. So every once in a while, when I do get a request, I go, okay, well, let's check this out. And frankly, some of them are not all that interesting. God bless them, because they do, uh, you know, they're making the pitch, and I appreciate that greatly. I really, really do. But if it doesn't make sense for the listener, because everything that I do is for the listener, and I don't mean that in a pandering sort of way, I mean that in an enlightened self-interest uh, sort of way, because if the listener is not interested in my guest, it's not going to be a good show, and if it's not a good show, that reflects really badly on me, so I want fantastic guests with fantastic topics that uh, will will have the listeners just riveted, it's like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm hearing this, I can't get this anywhere else, anyway, so, so I get a message from this guy. Richard Potter, I think is his name. Let me just double check this. Richard Potter. Yeah, there it is. And the subject matter is Pakistani Christians. And I'm going, what? Pakistani Christians? Well, if you know anything about me, look, I'm a high school graduate, and I don't know a whole lot about anything east of Long Island. All right? I grew up in Pittsburgh. And uh, I know Pakistan is a country over there, like the other part of the, like, the world, and the Christians, I'm not, I'm not a Christian. I don't really care anything about religion, any religion. I just don't care. But I thought, well, okay, this guy did take the time to reach out to me. So let me take a look at this. And so I start reading his pitch, and it's like, oh, my God. First, this guy's a Pittsburgher. He's got, uh, I think he went to Pitt. He's got family, I think, in Sewickley or whatever, uh, somewhere around there. And he started uh, his pitch about talking about two families, two Christian families, and they're stuck in Bangkok, uh, and they're Pakistani, and uh, uh, started going into all of the trials and tribulations that these poor people had, and just trying to eke out an existence of uh, practicing their faith and trying not to get killed in the process. And it was like, whoa, this is pretty interesting stuff here. 
And then he goes into stuff like ISIS and the United Nations, High Commissioner on Refugees, and then how the world really works, not the way that we uh, are presented it by the mainstream media. And I thought, you know, this guy's got a really interesting story for my listener, and I know this is something that the cable news channels haven't covered. At least I'm not aware of that or hardly anybody else. But this is a really interesting story. So I said, um, you know, I'm going to take a shot on this guy, this Richard uh, Potter. Well, I get in touch with him. Turns out he's a social worker and journalist from Pittsburgh. Is a yinzer. And he's uh, written for The Vice, The Diplomat, The Mantle, and... Um, he is my special guest uh, here on One to Be Three Radio. So, Richard, welcome. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Thank you. How on so earth? Much for me on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how on earth do you go from being a social worker and a journalist? How did that start? And why are you focusing on this crazy part of the world? Um, I actually began with some work uh, years ago, a couple years ago, focusing on refugees out of uh, Myanmar, which took me to Thailand. Um, and of all ways to meet uh, Christian Pakistanis that were fleeing, I um, <clears throat> I met one of the men in the story. Uh, the name I used for him there is Asad, um, which isn't I didn't use his real name, so he doesn't get any more trouble. Uh, but he was my waiter at a restaurant, and uh, we actually just um, connected. He told me a little bit of his background, and I ended up keeping in touch with him as things got worse and. Uh, the real reason I started to research and write on them was because he, he kept asking for help and, and trying to get people to help him, help the whole community that was um, living there. And it just seemed like nobody was willing to. And I, 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 I write fairly often, so I thought, you know, maybe I should cover this. And, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I was back out in, in Bangkok uh, this winter, and so I, um, I decided to meet with as many people as I could while I was there. What's the big picture here? Uh, are Christians being persecuted by Muslims in Pakistan? Is that like the big picture here? Um, essentially, yes. It's it's by um, uh, particularly Sunni Muslims who are the majority in the country, but not only um, by people, but also by the government in the country. Why? Why? Okay, Pakistan, overwhelmingly Muslim, but they're a U.S. ally, so I thought. And why do they care about a hand? And I'm assuming it's like a handful of Christians. What is it, like 1% of the Pakistani population or something like that? It's small, yeah. It wouldn't be more than, I'm guessing, 2 or 3%. Why do they care? Why would the Muslims care about the Christians in Pakistan? It seems like they've got much bigger issues to, to deal with. My personal belief yeah. is... Um, it's like a lot of places in the world. The government, um, sometimes it's, it's easiest to keep people from being upset with you if you have groups fighting each other. So uh, it, it, it's it's um, Christians that are persecuted. It's also um, other sects of Islam, so uh, Shia Muslims, and then uh, a group of Ahmadi Muslims are also targeted. Uh, they're killed fairly often, and, and there'll be sometimes there's a religious justification from that. But also sometimes it's just if your neighbor doesn't like you, they'll just make up something about you, so you'll be arrested for blasphemy, something like that. Good um, Lord. This, this, but, so this, this happens very frequently, and then um, you also have groups like uh, Taliban. There's a Pakistani branch of the Taliban inside of, um, inside of Pakistan who aren't actually part of the Afghan Taliban. They're separate, and it's, it gets really confusing. Um, but they, uh, they've uh, attacked churches. They sent suicide bombers to churches. It's the same group that sent a um, suicide bomber to a, a children's military school, um, which was, you know, the, the children there were Muslim as well. So it, it's you get this mix of people just violent everywhere. Not everywhere, but in a, a number of places. And they're all distrustful of each other. And then they tend to ultimately pick on the weakest link and the people at the bottom who are the Christians, the Hindus, uh, and the Ahmadi Muslims, get it the worst. Why is it a guy from Pittsburgh goes halfway around the world? What's the attraction to you, to that part of the world? Because that sounds like a crazy-ass part of the world where you could just very easily get killed. I mean, Myanmar, which to me is always going to be a Borneo, um, or Burma, I guess Burma is what they called it, and uh, we're, you know... 
what are you doing over there? I mean, you should be here in Pittsburgh watching the Steelers or something like that. What's the attraction for you to go halfway across the world to risk your life? You know, I I, I did spend most of my time in, uh, it was all in in Burma and Thailand. So both those countries, for me, they're pretty safe, you know. Um, I think the worst thing that could happen to me for even journalism or something like that would be uh, I would get deported at worst. And I don't think I've done anything um, controversial enough for them to even notice me. Hmm. Uh, well, that may change with this interview, but uh, okay. It right. might. It might be. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not about to go to Pakistan. I, I personally, I don't think I would be very safe there, uh, even if I had never written a word in my life. Yeah. Uh, um, just because of tensions at the moment, you know, uh, there is a lot of resentment, and, and some of the Christians actually. One of the other reasons they get targeted is because every time. Um, People in Pakistan feel like the Americans are attacking them or the West is attacking them. They pick on the Christians because they think that they're connected somehow. There are some really sick people over there. <laughs> some really, really it's... deranged people. So, okay, so you're in Thailand, Bangkok, and you meet this guy. Did you say his name is Asad? That's not like his real name. That's just like the That's name you real name, gave no. him so he doesn't get killed. So tell yeah. me about... First off, how's the food in Thailand? If you like Thai food, it's wonderful. Um, if you want American food, it's horrible. If you, <laughs> if you want Italian, you can find a few good places run by actual real-life Italian. They don't know how to do a good cheeseburger? Is that what you're saying? No, no not oh, at all. Those primitives. Anyway, so you're over there, you're eating Thai food, and this waiter, you, what, do you strike up a conversation with him, or how did this start? Sure. Uh, it was actually, of all food, it was um, Arabic food is uh, really good in Thailand as well. And that was the restaurant he worked at. It was um, an Arab restaurant, um, which was Pakistani-owned as well. Uh, but he just um, I had been there before. And generally, I don't know why, but when I'm in other countries, I like to talk to who, whoever's around me, uh, much more than I did in the States for some reason. Hmm. And, um, you know, I could tell he wasn't from uh, Thailand, but he was very nice. And we just sort of um, got along, and, and uh, I don't know. I just uh, he, he gave me his Facebook. Him and uh, two of the other men that worked there, who both turned out to be um, Christian as well, um, and they, they, you know, because I, I was wondering why he was there, and he explained the situation, I, and it provoked some compassion and sympathy. And the more I talked to him, um, at this point, he's one of my closest friends, to be honest. Wow. Um, it got to the uh, most of the interviews. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, he he had to move to a new restaurant, which I talked about in the piece. He's, um, and now he makes the equivalent of two hundred dollars a month to live on and try to feed himself and get his wife out of um, the immigration jail. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait! His wife is in him. His wife is in in jail, and they're yeah. Oh my well, god! That, that's what he told us when we met him. He said. Um, you know, uh, I was I was there with my uh, with my girlfriend, and we were just talking about these sorts of things. And he said, "My wife's at home, but I lock the door when I leave because the police do raids." And it turns out, um, at that time, they were they were doing really bad raids. They were going into every apartment complex that they thought there were foreigners, um, Asians mostly, um, South Asian. Um, and they would just sweep up everybody there that didn't have a visa, and they, they sent them all to um, these immigration jails, which are absolutely horrible. I've been inside of uh, the main one in Bangkok once. I went to uh, take food to um, Burmese refugees. And it's just it's an awful, overcrowded place, and there's all sorts of terrible allegations about what goes on inside. Well, the, explain it to 